it would be wholly, wholly unacceptable if the Fed now drove us into a recession, having got us this far. If you would have talked to me in October of last year, you said, look, Ophir, what if the Fed has to drive a recession to get inflation down? I was like, well, you know, that that's unfortunate, but we don't know. Now it's wholly unacceptable. I'll even go a step further. If if Chairman Powell leads a Fed that now puts the US economy into recession, given the data we have, I think it should be impeached. It's not now it's no longer acceptable. Ophir Gottlieb joins us for the first time. He is the CEO of Capital Market Laboratories. We're going to be answering some of the most frequently asked questions on investors' minds right now, including what will happen if the Fed doesn't cut rates? Is there a deadline for cutting rates? Uh, what's going to happen to the economy next? Is there actually going to be a recession? It's going to be the most telegraphed recession in history now. Well, is it actually going to happen? We'll find out what's going to happen to tech stocks, what's going to happen to the broad markets. Ophir will answer all these questions and a lot more and talk about how to invest, generally speaking, in the AI theme. This episode is brought to you by iTrust Capital, an IRA that offers 35 crypto assets and the lowest trading fees in the crypto IRA space at 1%. If you'd like to learn more and get started, click on itrust.capital slash David in the link down below. If you use my referral link to get started, you will get $100 in signing bonuses. If you're over 18 and you'd like to open a new account or roll over an existing account with cash, click on the link down below to get started and learn about the unique tax benefits as well. Welcome to the show of fear. Thank you. So thank you so much for having me, David. Thank you for uh, being here. I, I I spoke to Michael Gayed, who was a regular on my show. And I asked him, who is one fund manager that you personally respect a lot or look up to? And the only name that came up with yours. So <laughs> I was uh, looking forward far, to that. Far too high of praise. My, Michael's mistaken. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're very humble. I spoke with you offline. You're brilliant. Let's talk about your outlook first. You told me, well, actually, before that, that. You said in another podcast that you see significant pain outside the tech sector. We know the tech sector has been leading the S&P 500, but what do you mean by that statement? There's this focus on companies that have to get involved in generative AI in order to succeed. That's the tech sector. So they're going to be involved in some manner. Some of them will get run over, but they'll be a part of it. In the non-tech sector, it's the statistic that you and I were talking about. Over half of the uh, SMBs that have taken these loans um, are unable to pay their rent now. That's that this Bloomberg came out with this report. The number was 43%. And if you look a little bit under the under the into the details, you'll see it's actually over 50% for companies that are not in the tech sector. You can see it in almost anything. Restaurants is a very good way to see it. You know, same store sales are dropping and it looks like their revenue is rising, but that's because they're opening more and more stores. And that's just not sustainable. That, that's what happens at the end of a cycle, right? Um, and so it's it's getting very painful for SMBs because they cannot find a commitment to long-term capital and small and medium-sized businesses. If they're not growing, they're shrinking. It's not It's not like Apple or NVIDIA where they can just pause for a second. And if they pause for long enough, that means layoffs. And if layoffs go on long enough, then they'll go out of business. So they'll, be, they'll become insolvent. And if they become insolvent, then in order for us to recover, it's not just the Fed cutting rates then, it's business formation. This is the heartbeat of what is the backbone of the American economy. And it concerns me the most is the S SMB sentiment. Are they willing to invest right now? The answer is no. NFIB small business survey has been uh, trending down. I mean, it's not like abysmally collapsing, but it's been trending down. I'm going to read the stat to you that I brought up a couple of times this past week on my show. U.S. small business rent delinquencies rise to a three-year high. This is according to Bloomberg. Um, it says here, the small business rent report from Alignable, which provides an online networking platform for owners, found that 43% of small businesses were unable to pay their rent in full due to economic headwinds. That's the highest delinquency rate since March 2021. What's your response to this? It's a data point, which is one that is very understandable, which gets to the heart of what I'm saying. SMBs in essentially all manner are either just barely hanging on, they're, they're okay for a little while, or they're already teetering, right? So that, that 43% number, they're, they, they're teetering, they're, they're going down. Uh, that might mean insult. Is this? I, I was just thinking the other day. Is this like a normal stat though? Because we do know that a lot of small businesses don't survive past year two if they're open, right? So perhaps this is just the norm. I don't know. Also, there was an, a massive amount of business formation coming out of that uh, with the fiscal stimulus and all. Stimulus. So, so a, li a little bit of this is going to be like, what's the denominator? Uh, th things like that. What was what what or what is it even the numerator? What are these new formations? Right. I would just take it as a trend. So economic data, this is a really crucial thing. Economic data, when it takes on a trajectory like inflation, it's very, very hard to turn around and it really turns around where you want it to, right? You can't just say, we're going to get to 2% inflation by having top, tight monetary policy, and then we're going to let it go. It tends to keep going. So this, this rent number you bring up, 
Maybe they want that number to be there because there's over business formation, but it's not going to stop where they want it to. It just doesn't work like that with, with economic data. It's not like a stock. You don't put in a stop loss. Ultimately, why are we talking about the economy? The economy is not the markets. This gets to the heart of our discussion. The economy is not the markets is so something I've heard, right? Just because the economy is doing well or poorly doesn't mean the stock markets are fully pricing that in. We're reflecting that at any given time. So ultimately, why do we care where the economy is headed? Because the economy right now is being driven by an irritant. And the irritant is uh, overly tight uh, monetary policy. And so therefore, we have to talk about it because what the Fed thinks about the economy or what the Fed thinks about inflation is the only thing that matters. It doesn't even matter what the data is at this point. It just matters what the Fed thinks. And the Fed stance is so tight and has become tight so quickly uh, that it's going to impact what we're talking about, SMBs, greatly. Because again, SMBs always have to invest or they're shrinking and they don't know what their cost of capital is right now. So they're choosing not to. That's in the tech sector and non-tech sector. So why are we? Fo- it's true the market isn't the economy, unless there's a recession, and then the economy is the then the economy is the market. All of a sudden we're in a recession. Nothing does well. So the market is not the economy until the economy is in recession. I'm talking about the economy because I think we might be headed to a recession unless the Fed changes its stance re- relatively quickly. Okay, well let's talk about that. Let's get right to the heart of the discussion. You think we're going to get into a recession unless the Fed? Uh, does something, which is what, pivot? Uh, Yeah, pivot. So, all right, let's take a step back. Uh, The Fed has a dual mandate. Okay, maximum employment and price stability. Fancy way of saying the employment market market and inflation. We have seen uh, the unemployment rate where today is July 5th. So we just saw a non-farm payroll report. The unemployment rate went up to 4.1%. Thankfully, the participation rate also went up 0.1%. So it's the employment rate is the same, but okay. We're at a multi-year high for the unemployment rate. Continuing jobless claims are at multi-year highs. Uh, infl- uh, wage inflation is at lows not seen since pre-pandemic. So th- this, I, th- the employment market is cracking. Job openings are the lowest they've been since uh, uh, pre-pandemic. Wage inflation is coming down. PCE, which is the measure which the Fed tries to get inflation down to 2%, that's already at 2% if you look at harmonized CPI or harmonized PCE. We just have this lag with, with rent, which is obtuse. Credit card delinquencies are up. Saving rates, we have this cumulative sort of excess savings from fiscal, fiscal policy. That's all gone. Uh, GDP growth has slowed. Real disposable personal income growth has slowed. We are on the verge of rolling over. How do we get out of the verge of ro- rolling over? is by the Fed cutting rates. And the Fed doesn't have to cut aggressively, but they have to cut sooner rather than later because of this this problem with SMBs. SMBs will become insolvent and reformation takes too long of a time. So as I see it, it would be wholly, wholly unacceptable if the Fed now drove us into a recession, having got us this far. If you would have talked to me in October of last year, you said, look, Ophir, what if the Fed has to drive a recession to get inflation down? I was like, well, you know, that that's unfortunate, but we don't know. Now it's wholly unacceptable. I'll even go a step further. If if Chairman Powell leads a Fed that now puts the U.S. economy into recession, given the data we have, I think it should be impeached. It's not now. It's no longer acceptable. Okay, based on based on the fact that he's spinning the economy into a recession unnecessarily, is that why he should be impeached? If if he doesn't cut rates, yes. If he doesn't not cut yet. rates, right? He does, there's no impeachment now. Okay. When, when is rates. the? I, I I understand. We're talking hypothetically here. When is the hypothetical? I guess theoretical deadline for cutting rates for you? I would say I would say September. Okay. If he if he's not cutting by September, then then we're we've pro- probably or possibly rolled over, and we're now taking too far too large of a risk. I'll just point something else out. If you sure. take out, I know people like to say like, hey, you can make inflation look any way you want because yeah. if you take out all the things that are going up, you're only left with things going down. Okay, let's just stop all of that. Core PCE is two point five seven percent, and I'm not that's year over year. I'm not taking anything out or mixing data or taking out lags. Is it worth putting the U.S. economy into a recession? when the inflation measure that the Fed looks at is at 2.57%, with the unemployment rate at three-year highs, continuing jobless claims at, at, at three-year highs, and wage inflation at five-year at five lows? The answer is no. This one's for my viewers who, who've been following me ever since last year when I launched this show. I've been talking about a recession ever since last year. It hasn't come yet, Ophir. And now people are saying, why are you still talking about this? It's not going to come. It's not coming. It hasn't happened yet, so it's not going to happen. What's your view? Let's hope. Let's hope that's true. Let's ha- hope the Fed cuts a, a quarter point. Lots of people say, what does a quarter point matter? A qu- quarter point matters massively in the SMB world. It's a signal. So let's see. Um, I think that we will see it. The odds as of right now, we're talking, I think the odds of a rate cut, the September FOMC meeting have risen to like 80%. 
I think there will be a drumbeat if we, I think we're going to get good PCE, CPI, and PPI numbers out in July before the July meeting. I think there will be a drumbeat for a possible cut in July. Right. And at least at the press, at least the press conference, he's going to talk, start really signaling about September. Okay. So that's it. Let's talk about inflation versus a recession because you, you, you're right. I mean, it, it, let's let's suppose the Fed keeps monetary policy too tight for too long. Eventually, the economy rolls over. That's bad. He should be in pre impeached. We talked about that. But on the other hand, we can take the view that, well, if he doesn't do that, inflation is going to remain sticky, if not go back up. So what's worse, a recession or inflation? One could argue that a recession affects uh, people who are in the job markets, but inflation affects everyone equally. Correct. So we're talking about probabilities and the probabilities that the, that inflation will rise with the rate cut are very low. And remember, right now we're being very US centric, which is a very US thing to do. <laughs> if you look globally, look at the UK, look at Germany, look at France, it, EC, the ECB in general, which and they've already cut rates, inflation is coming down across the globe. We don't have inf our inflation problem wasn't a mystery, right? COVID was the irritant. Right. It, this pandemic happened. The further we get from the irritant, the less irritated we will be. The argument for higher inflation, while there is one, should the Fed cut rates, is is pretty weak relative to all of this data I've just spouted out about the employment market. Right. We have actual data versus hypothetical data. Everything is going down worldwide in terms of inflation. It's over. Right. Do, do, I, do I think the Fed should cut rates by 200 basis points? No. I think they should signal to SMBs that it's not going to be higher by making a quarter point cut. That's what I think. Okay, why is it that the Fed refuses to cut rates even though the other pure central banks have already done so, despite their inflation rates not coming down to 2%? I'm talking about the Bank of Canada, for example. Mm -hmm. Inflation here where I live in Canada is 2.9. By the mm -hmm. ECB, inflation is in 2% in most of the Eurozone countries. Why have they cut prematurely, if you want to use the word prematurely, and the Fed hasn't yet? So I'll give two reasons, and they're just, they're just suppositions. My first supposition with regard to the ECB is that many countries in Europe are in a recession, and they've seen that pain. Okay. Um, my answer uh, for the Fed, and this is just, it's just a guess. I think the Fed is terrified of being wrong about cutting too early. And they're not being flexible enough to understand that the worst case scenario is not that they cut and then inflation goes up. Remember, if they cut and inflation goes up, I don't think it will happen. They can raise again. There's nothing that's, there's, they're not handcuffed. Will it, will it be a bobble in the market if that happens? It'll move currency markets? Of course. They're not handcuffed. If they cut and things look like inflation's coming back, they can raise again. Why would we risk? That risk is very low. There, there is a solution to that. There is a remedy. In the meantime, there's really not a remedy to SMBs going out of business other than business formation, which takes years. Well, okay. So why do you think that a uh, uh, an Arthur Burns scenario is unlikely? That is the fear. Sure. So if we revisit the 60s, 70s, and 80s, the inflation irritant in that period, so three Arthur Burns, and then Arthur Burns came in and Reagan just let him do whatever he had to do, right? Well, we had, we got off the gold standard. We had the end of the Vietnam War. Uh, we had um, a, an Iranian regime change, right? A revolution. Uh, we had an OPEC, I don't know if it was called OPEC then, an OPEC embargo. I mean, all of these things were, the, the irritants, were, they're always different, but they're very well telegraphed. We know what they were, and those aren't happening now. It was COVID. We know what the irritant was. It was COVID. The further we get from that irritant, the less irritated we will be. The risk of getting another Arthur Burns type sort of reflash of inflation, having to raise rates even higher, that risk is very low. Now, I'm a mathematician. Do I take, is there such thing as a measure of zero? No, probabilities are not zero. I'm talking about hard data that shows the employment market is in trouble, well, is weakening, let's say, that inflation is falling, and I can give you 13 nations where it's falling. I can show you other data that shows inflation has been where it should have been for the last 12 months. So the probabilities are there's more likely we'll face a recession than see a resurgence of inflation. Let's go with the probabilities and make sure we don't get a recession. If they're wrong, raise rates again. It's not a beautiful way to do it, but just do it. Can you take the view? Well, do you take the view that the uh, money supply contraction or growth during the pandemic has largely been responsible for the 9% inflation that we saw and the subsequent decline to the current rate of inflation? I don't think money supply has anything to do with it. No, I think fiscal policy does. I think that was responsible, partially responsible for inflation. I think supply chains were, and a part of the supply chain problem was fiscal, fiscal, uh, fiscal response. But I'm, I'm not, I've not seen conclusive evidence that monetary policy. I, I've seen charts which show correlation. Yeah. For sure. I Certainly, if you, if you, yeah, if you, if you, if you correlate CPI uh, change versus the money supply change year over year, there's yes. a very, very close correlation. But th yes, you can see, you, you can see a chart of correlation. Causation, I haven't seen. Also, you know, David, think about. I mean, we were in ZERP for five or six years post 
um, the Great Recession, mm -hmm. we wished we saw inflation. <laughs> right. So what is I, worse just, for an economy, inflation or deflation? Uh, do, if they're the same magnitude, I would say. That's a good question. Yeah. Yeah. If it's the same magnitude, I'd rather be Japan than Brazil. So de deflation. Yeah. Deflation, doesn't that imply job losses, lowering wages as well? It does. It implies it implies Japan for the last, almost right. the last 40 years, but it's it's less convulsive and less violent than um, inflation. Most of the world's revolutions, I'm talking about the French Revolution, we can just go back far now, are due to inflation. People can't afford to eat. They're going to revolt. Let them eat cake didn't work that well. It ended up with a head and a guillotine. So inflation is really insidious. They're both insidious, by the way, but if I'm given a choice between the two, inflation is more insidious. All right. So September deadline for a Fed cut. Uh, well, let's just talk about how likely inflation is to come down from 2.6 core PCE right now to close to two. I mean, if they're dead set on two, it has to come down 60 basis points in the next two months. Yeah. So to be clear, I'll tell you what they've said, not how they've acted. What they've said is inflation does not have to come to 2% for them to cut. They have to feel confident that it will be going to 2%. So, so th there's a, that's a big distinction. I, I promise you inflation won't hit 2% by September. And if it does, something's gone horribly wrong. We're rolling over. So a year over year measure of inflation is really just a fancy way of saying you drop the 13th, 13th month and add this month in to this 12 month series, right? So we're dropping 13th months starting in September that were very, very low last year. It's going to be hard to see that year over year number come down. So I, I think, and I actually think in the summary of economic projections, the Fed saw a core PCE at 2.6 or 2.8 at year end. So they're actually expecting inflation to come up a little bit. So the Fed's actually expecting that and still saying they're going to cut. So this is all baked in. So I don't think we're going to see 2% inflation before we cut. Well, even if we get a 25 basis point cut, like you mentioned before, um, perhaps that's a strong signal, but how is that going to help the small businesses? It will, it, from, what, well, from what I'm hearing, right, from people that are, they have 700,000 SMBs as customers. They just want to make sure their cost of capital isn't going up. They'd even do it here if they knew, right? But they can't see their cost of capital go up again. And so the, the idea is, what I'm hearing is that a cut would signal to them, okay, look, maybe he'll cut once and they won't cut for 18 months. I don't know. But their cost of capital isn't going up. They're going to reinvest as opposed to the opposite of reinvesting for an SMB, which is just cutting jobs. Right. Th those are the two choices. They can't stand still. Going back to the 43 percent can't pay rent. I mean, cutting rates isn't going to lower the rent. Right. So they they so, still they still have, uh, from what I'm gathering, fixed costs are a problem for small businesses. For some of them. Yeah. Yeah. We're talking about the rest. Right. So 43 percent right. sounds really bad. 50 percent outside of the tech sector sounds really bad. Yeah. But what sounds worse is 83 percent. Right. So we have to make the companies that can make payroll higher and grow, or we're going to start seeing those other problems and you're going to see the unemployment rate go up. Which sectors are most at risk of, I guess, higher layoffs right now? So in, I'm talking my book a little bit. <laughs> um, I think restaurants are, I think there are some restaurants that uh, are in trouble. So um, it's just, it's, there was this behavior out of COVID, this services-based behavior, and we just had the services uh, ISM PMI just come in below 50. So in contraction, businesses that are human intensive, uh, you know, you know, I don't know, um, going for a massage, um, restaurants, I think those are at, at real risk of a recession. And you can already see it. If you're look, if you're reading their, um, their earnings calls and looking deeply into the, the cues, you can already see like in the footnotes, like there, there's already this language change where they're getting a little bit more nervous. Uh, and I think those are the industries that are at the biggest risk. Having said that, I just want to be clear. I don't think there's like safety if there's a recession. So I'm not trying to, I'm not saying, hey, you avoid those industries. If you go into recession, you'll be fine. No, I, I don't think that at all. That's interesting. Let's talk about that for a sec. You don't think there are safe haven assets in case the economy rolls over or the stock markets decline? There are safe haven assets. I don't think there are safe haven equities. Okay. What what are some of these safe haven assets? Uh, just the 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 stalwarts, right? Um, U.S. treasuries, um, uh, any kind of uh, gr uh, income-based funds, uh, th things like that. I don't think you, maybe some currencies. <laughs> uh, I don't think you want to be in equities altogether. Of course, the, the, there tend to be these defensives, these companies they call defensive that tend to do better in a recession. But I think in a recession post-COVID, I think everything will be hurt and th they might get hurt less, these defensives. Oh, so let's, talk about, let's talk about treasury market for, for just a bit. How much of the, um, of the run-up in 
and the yield uh, from June to July, well, it's come back down now. Yeah. Uh, but how much of that was due to the Bank of Japan? Um, do you think the Bank of Japan will have any impact on the treasury markets whatsoever? So presumably, if they have to intervene to prop up the yen, which is now, I think, 161.4 or something like that, um, yeah. wouldn't that have any impact at all on the treasury market? Yeah, I think it will. That's another reason to to, to hope for a Fed cut. Um, yes. So there's this um, underlying, it, it's sort of like, it's a horror movie and everyone knows the monsters in the corner and everyone's looking everywhere but the corner because they don't want to deal with the monster. They don't, they don't want to deal with the monster over there. Okay, there is a monster, which we haven't really talked about, which is a potential unwind of the the, the, the yen carry trade. Um, you said you had Michael Guyad on. There's no better, no better analyst who's closer to it than that. Um, if the Bank of Japan, okay, let's say the Fed doesn't cut the Bank of Japan actually intervenes and they intervene more than they have now. So they actually, let's say, raise rates. <clears throat> there's a real risk that there's an unwind. And the unwind, what, what is right, right now is people are borrowing in the yen to buy, let's say, U.S. risk assets. Okay, if we have to unwind that, then U.S. risk assets are going to get mashed. Um, the yen will finally strengthen. That, that might be a safe haven if there's a recession, right? Assets and currencies. But it would be it would be an earthquake. And that's something that I, not a lot other than Michael and probably you, not a lot of people are talking about that, or I'll I'll include myself in the other group. We're kind of focused, laser focused on like, hey, is it tech stocks? Is it this? Is it this industry? Is it that industry? That's one that would discombobulate everything. Um, and then you would have to play incredibly defensively. And you probably, I, I think, maybe be in the um, in the currency market to try to find any kind of return. Um, and even safe havens could be not as safe as people expect. Are you but are you assigning a significant probability to this tail risk event um, to the extent that it would impact your portfolio allocation? So it has not affected my portfolio. I'll take that as two questions. So yes, it's significant and it has not affected my portfolio allocation. I will say this. I said this, I told this to Michael uh, a while ago. Mm -hmm. When there's a probability distribution, we don't really know what it is. We we mm -hmm. we, we experience it and we guess it, but it's non-parameterized. You can't write it down like on a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. Okay. What we can recognize is, is how is the distribution changing? If a tail event, let's say there was a one in a million, I'm just gonna make them something totally obtuse. Let's say there's a one in a million chance that the Bank of Japan was gonna intervene. Let's say three years ago. It's just, there, there's no intervention risk. This carry trade has been 40 years, we'll just keep doing it. If that one in a million risk went to one in a thousand, it just became a thousand times more likely. Is that a trivial change? No. Has it changed my portfolio allocation? No. I see. So I think the probability, and I can't put numbers on it, unfortunately. Sure. But there's been some order of magnitude. I do believe it's an order of magnitude, maybe two orders of magnitude, higher risk. I still think in arithmetic, it looks like a small number. I right? see. But the probability has absolutely changed and it does impact risk, um, uh, sort of risk premia. It should affect risk premia. Um, and this could be one where it could catch us all kind of, probably not you and Michael, but it would catch someone like me, kind of catch me by the throat. Like it's almost too late to realize that the probability wasn't one in a million to one in a thousand. It might have been one in a thousand to one in three, and now we're in the one in three, and that's just going to grab us by the throat. I don't think that will happen, but it's okay, possible. yeah, that, that's that's a fair point. I mean, that the magnitude of probabilities is still relatively small, but it's gotten bigger. Okay, so let's talk about U.S. markets. How long can we expect the tech sector to just carry the rest of the S and P five hundred? In fairness, if you don't mind, I'll say it's not the tech sector; it's six or seven stocks, right? <laughs> okay, not, fair enough. Yeah, all right. right, right. So in this environment where credit card delinquencies are rising, savings are spent, um, jobless claims, continuing jobless claims are rising, unemployment rate is rising, um, monetary policy is restrictive, however restrictive we want to put a, an a adjective in front of it. It kind of makes sense that these companies that can have full pricing power and unlimited money and are continuing, continuing to either buy stock or increase dividends, so pay back uh, shareholders, it makes sense they would go up. I don't know about this much, but it makes sense that this group of companies would do it. The question is, okay, well, what, what, how long and what now? If we stay like this, they can actually be leaders for a while. I just think that this incredible dispersion will keep happening. I think, I believe, if the Fed cuts and SMBs are given a little bit of rope, I do believe we'll see that unwind a little bit. So I believe that we will start seeing things like the equal weighted S&P move uh, more with more strength than the S&P 500, which is completely opposite. Or the you know the the, the end all be all would be if the Russell came back. All of a sudden we kind of see this this value play back. Um, I think if the Fed cuts, we not only avert a recession, we also kind of fix this highly concentrated market.
If we don't, and it stays as concentrated, I just don't think there's any doubt that at some time, next month, next year, three years, it turns into, you know, the Cisco Microsoft problem of the dot-com bubble. I don't think we're there yet, but if it persists, that, that's where we end up. Well, it seems to me that these six, seven stocks are more or less disconnected from everything else we've discussed in the economy. So why not just, you know, this is just one position. Why not just place bets in those stocks? Go away. Leave it alone. Uh, so, so far, been a great idea. Uh, t- totally worthwhile. I think if we get this uh, Fed loosening, I think that it actually, I think the opposite trade would work. So I think being long, me- well, not think it's in retrospect now, being long mega and short anything else was a great idea. At some point that trade too will reverse. Uh, and I, I hope it reverses because we, not because we face a recession, but because we avert a recession. You know, you've got a tech background. I'd like to ask you more about tech and AI uh, for the, for this part of our conversation. <laughs> Let's talk about NVIDIA, the darling of 2024. <laughs> well, actually 2023 as well. Um, how much of the uh, outperformance versus its peers can be sustained, you think? Is it really the clear chip leader in the sector or is it just hype? I, I like to know from a technical perspective. Sure. So, so I certainly, the outperformance won't continue. So for example, it, I mean, just tautologically, NVIDIA won't be up fivefold again and be worth $15 trillion. Sure, sure. So just, you know, I know that's not a particularly great answer, but just, just numerically. Um, but yes, NVIDIA is far and away the chip leader. Uh, it's not just, they're not just a hardware company anymore. I got into NVIDIA in like 2015. Um, they're, they're a software company too, and they are absolutely dominant. Um, I, I, there, it's very difficult to draw um, sort of real world corollaries that are, are outside of the chip sector. But I would say, let, let's take 15 years ago, I would say kind of the dominance that Coca-Cola had over the beverage market. It's just like, there was just nothing else, maybe 20 years ago. There's just nothing else. Um, their their advantage seems to be sustainable. Now, will it sustain forever? I don't know. There's some really interesting private companies right now that their chips look pretty good. Okay. But yes, I think it's fair to say NVIDIA's dominance uh, is about as large as their outperformance. I do not think NVIDIA will continue to outperform this much. It just doesn't make sense. They're going to become larger than the U.S. economy. So it's got to slow down unless we get really, really bubbly, in which case, you know, duck. I, I, I have to ask you about this. We'll come back to NVIDIA in just a bit. I have to ask you about this. Nancy Pelosi and Paul Pelosi, her husband, disclosed uh, investment trades uh, or trades made in the last month between June 24th, uh, June 20, yeah, June 24th to July 1st. According to the disclosure, they purchased 20 Broadcom call options um, uh, with a value of about one to five million dollars, purchased 10,000 shares of NVIDIA stock with a trade value between one to five million dollars, sold 2,500 shares of Tesla, and sold 2,000 shares of Visa stock. Okay, notwithstanding the jokes, uh, <laughs> the jokes aside, it does this. Narrative makes sense. Uh, the uh, the overweights on certain types of companies, underweights or selling of other companies. Tesla's had a terrible year, for example. Well, I mean, in general, yes. If you're not talking about those specific companies, absolutely going underweight and overweight. I mean, that's an active portfolio. I'm not terribly interested in what the Pelosi's are doing. I don't think, and it's not just the Pelosi's. I don't, I don't think people in Congress are particularly good stock traders. Sure, if they get a wink, wink handshake of a deal that's going to go on. I think they can be great stock investors. It's called insider information. Other than that, I, I wouldn't really pay attention. Uh, that's not, that's certainly not my focus. And I wouldn't, <clears throat> I wouldn't focus. I, 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 it wouldn't impact my portfolio. I do think the general idea of rebalancing is a great idea. So we have to talk about Tesla, a monster 40% rally over the last one month. Okay. It was, you know, I, I, I spoke too soon. It was a bad stock and now it's just rally 40%. So it's uh, a lot of it was due to a deliveries numbers. Um, 25% beat on the second quarter delivery numbers. Uh, stock recently was up at two, uh, was it now 250? It was at 177 just a month ago. Um, what's your read on this? Well, the street got pretty bearish on Tesla. They, they're still shrinking. Remember, this is a company, Elon Musk said, we're going to grow 50% compounded annual growth for the foreseeable future. Uh, and they're shrinking. And yes, they beat estimates, but I think they still shrank. Someone should check me on this number. I still think they shrank double digits. I think they still shrank 10% in deliveries. I'm, I'm not sure that's right. I don't watch them that carefully. But it was just, it was a matter of being very, very bullish and sort of a whipsaw. Um, I don't know how to value Tesla because you certainly can't value it as an audible meal baker. It's, it's energy business is ripping. It's small, but, but not insignificant, maybe worth $30 a share. Like that, that's something. Um, this is one of those, there's, I believe behavior has changed since COVID. 
So when everyone stayed at home and fiscal po fiscal policy was very uh, encouraging, let's say, and we got we really got a new flavor of people investing in the market. And there are there simply are meme stocks, and Tesla is a real company. So I don't I don't mean to compare it to GME, but sure. It used to be that when someone said a stock price is just a show of demand for this piece of paper, right? If there's more buyers and sellers, it'll go up. And that's true, but it was trite. The reason there was a demand for the paper is because of fundamental underlying fundamentals, right? I don't know about some of these companies anymore. I don't know if that's a trite way to look at the market anymore. I think there are some companies where it's simply demand for the paper. That's interesting. You know, this is one perspective, according to this Yahoo article, an analyst um, uh, uh Quoted in this article says that we continue to believe that Tesla is more of an AI and robotics play than a traditional car company. Now the rubber meets the road as the street anticipates August 8th is a key linchpin day for the Tesla story. Now, okay, this is an interesting narrative because on the one hand, if you think Tesla is not a car company, which should not be valued as a car company, why does the street care about an EV deliveries beat in the second <laughs> quarter? That You know, like what? David, never let logic get in the way of a bad argument. Um, was that Dan or Gene that said that in the quote? Uh, Dan Ives or Gene, Gene Wed Ives. Bush. Yeah, Dan. Okay. Yeah. Well, he's a, he's an Uber Tesla bull, and you know what? He's been right for a long time. So I can't cast aspersions, but it's always Dan or Gene that, that bring up the AI story. Let's see. Uh, I'm not sure Tesla. I have been in the past. I'm not. I have no position. Uh, I understand the arguments, right? I think you understand the argument. Hey, it's an AI story. Don't worry about the cars. You made a really good point. Well, if it's not an automobile company, why do we care about deliveries? Well, I don't know. That seems like a logical argument to me. I'm not sure. I can't answer that. Okay. Ophir, what is the AI play for you? The investment thesis around AI, what does that mean for you as not just a you know, mathematician, but also an investor? Yeah. So I have this sort of, I'll go on a bit of a soliloquy. Okay. So first of all, Generative AI is going to be absolutely magnificent, but it's also going to make a lot of companies become worthless. So it's it's two-tailed. It's not just roses and flowers. Okay. Um, it, in fact, I've said this before. I think it's going to be a violent and sustained earthquake on the software ecosystem. Okay. And the normal things analysts look at, I'm an analyst of record for some companies. That just means, you know, when they say consensus estimates or blah, 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 I'm in the consensus. Okay. So generally as, a, as an analyst of record, we look at things like certain key performance indicator, KPI, right? Like, uh, billings, remaining performance obligations, annual recurring revenue, dollar-based net expansion rate, things like that. The things that you would, your fundamental analysts are like, what do you, revenue growth, earnings growth, whatever, margins. Okay, that's not going to be good enough. That's going to be, that's going to take too long. Software analysis is now entering a phase where it's never entered before. It, I call it value by expert. So you actually need to know what the companies do and not just look at their KPIs. So you have to ask yourself with each company, literally each company, why will why will their code base not be replicated? Why will why will why will it matter what they're doing? Why can't I make it in six months with very little effort, let's say part time? Why are the public technical documentations which say, "Hey, our software does this"? The, the, the doc technical documentations are pretty uh, detailed and they go to large customers. Why is that not just the prolog pro prologue of the epitaph? That sounds like a, an epitaph to me. You tell me what your company does. I'll put it into generative AI and I'll just make it myself. Okay. So this is about to get very, very difficult, far more difficult than it's been. Uh, it's going to rattle public and private markets. Uh, one out of 100, maybe, software analysts will be able to disambiguate the maybe one out of 1,000 or 10,000 software companies that are going to make it. The amount of product that's going to be created digitally, this is my view, my estimates, is going to be anywhere from 10,000 to 1 million percent higher than people believe. But that's just the creation of product. It doesn't mean successful product. It's the creation of product. So, okay, how do you invest now? I just said that. That I didn't answer your question, but I had to give you. I had to give you the soliloquy first. Okay. What are the parts of generative AI? What is it going to impact? And which companies in each of those silos are poised for success? Okay, there's going to be more need for infrastructure. Okay, I'm taking out the chips now. I'm saying like say clouds. Okay. Let's say let's say ten thousand percent more product. It's got to have to, digital product's going to have to sit somewhere. Okay, so you have to look at infrastructure. It's not all of them. Some of them. Those products they're going to have to be observed on the infrastructure. That infrastructure is called observability. The applications you need application performance management, right? Um, you you create you create you create all of this. Every single thing that's created digitally is going to need to be secured. Right? We call it cybersecurity. Okay. With all of these products, they're going to have to be sold. If they're going to be sold, that means there need to be ads. Right? These are silos in which they're derivatives of the generative AI boom. 
but they're derivatives that you can invest in that aren't directly into trying to pick the winners. Some of them are directly into picking the winners. So you say, okay, you still didn't answer the question. Okay, so here's my answer. Pick those silos, identify them, understand them. We have a very unique opportunity right now since nothing's happening other than the, the mega, the Magnificent Seven or Fabulous Five. It doesn't matter, whatever we want to call it, the, the mega caps. But one thing is happening. Stocks aren't, stock prices aren't happening, their businesses are happening. We have an opportunity now where everything's kind of on pause, where we can look at which businesses are outperforming other businesses, right? And I'm talking really technically. Which things are they developing that are creating a moat? How can you see that happening? Right? If you can find those companies, then when uh, so the period I call after this, after this, where we're only talking about macro, we're only talking about the Fed, we're only talking about the Magnificent Seven. So after this, okay, you have a chance now to see who there's a higher probability of the companies will be successful after this right now. You can't just stare at your screen and be bored and wonder why your stocks aren't moving. Turn off your screens, look at the businesses, look at their software. If you're not an expert, find an expert. And this is the time. So how do you win with generative AI? Stop looking at stock prices right now. Start looking at businesses. See which ones are going to win after this. This is a very, very unique time. We don't ever get pauses in the market. We got to pause. For all intents and purposes, the small mid-cap tech is kind of, I've never, I know there's some that did well, some that didn't. Small and mid-cap tech, they're stuck. Great. That's their stock price. That's not their business. Then go in each silo, observability, application performance management, cybersecurity, ads, infrastructure, platform, each silo, each silo, who's the leader? Why are they the leader? Who's the risk? And then you ask yourself two questions and then you got your answer. What is changing? What is changing in the industry? Is that change underappreciated? Or what is not changing in the industry? Is that underappreciated? If either of those are underappreciated or both, and they're outperforming their peers right now, you've probably got yourself a moneymaker, but it takes that much effort. Well, thank you for teaching us how to fish, Ophir. <laughs> we appreciate that. Uh, what I'm wondering, a lot of people wondering too, is how these AI, these specifically these AGI companies mm -hmm. are going to make money. What is their business model? In fact, Sam Altman was asked this very question by a reporter. I don't know if, don't know if you saw this trend, trending on social media. Somebody asked him at a conference, how are you going to make money for your investors? He says, we have no current plans to make revenue. We have no idea how we may one day generate revenue. Um, we have made a soft promise to investors that once we've built this sort of generally intelligent system, um, basically we will ask it to figure out a way to generate an investment return for you. <laughs> Yeah, this sounds like a Silicon Valley episode, uh, but we're dead serious. Um, so I'll ask you the same question. How are they going to make money? I don't know, and that's why I'm not looking at them. I think that there's, I think there's going to be one to three of these generative AI companies, these sort of next level ones that are going to act as sort of the, I'll call them the operate, the new operating systems of technology. Right? We used to have Windows and iOS. They'll be the new operating systems. Okay, though it's easy to make money as an operating system. We've, it's been done over and over and over again. IBM did it. They, they gave it away to Microsoft. Microsoft did it. Apple's doing it. Um, Google's doing it with Android. That's very doable. Become, be, op, becoming an operating system is very monetizable. You make a lot, a lot of money. Uh, but if you go one level, one derivative from there, it becomes quite difficult. And I would just go back to exactly what I said. Okay, stop watching stock prices. Start figuring out what's changing, what isn't changing, what's underappreciated, which silo it fits in, which silo has the most opportunity and go there. How is... Sam, Alt, Sam Altman's new AGI company going to go make money? I, I don't know. <laughs> Generally speaking, what, how, you know, is, is, is the key to just partnerships like OpenAI with Apple then? Well, for OpenAI, uh, yes. Uh, for Apple, because they did such an atrocious job in building their own AI, yes. But in, let's say, let's step out of that world and go just to generative AI without that and we go to like just, just enterprise software. It's going to be who can understand the things that will create. So, okay, I'll take a step back. There was this article, and I'm sorry, I can't name the source. It was reputable, but I can't, I don't remember the source. Someone said, if you look at the amount of money that's been spent on uh, GPUs, chips, just hard, just semiconductors, there has to be $600 billion of revenue, revenue that has to come from this, right? So that was the spend. The, the infrastructure company spent this to get that. That's how much more revenue has to, that's how much revenue has to come to justify it. And that's just not true. 600 billion might be the right number. I have no idea what the methodology was, but it has to be in productivity gains and or revenue. 
So look at the software companies, which are going to introduce productivity gains. That will generally come because they're, for, they're forming a moat, right? They don't necessarily have to sell more seats. They're creating productivity. Final question. This is not so much financial, but just uh, from your experiences working in the um, uh, working in the tech field, what um, are you most looking forward to in terms of changing our consumer experience or changing our lifestyle when it comes to generative AI? Like, so what are the, like the the really good parts of generative AI? Is what you're getting at? Like, how does it make our life better? Yeah, if if it indeed will. Sure. Well, let's take the good side because there's the bad side. Um, I think it's gonna it's gonna make a lot of tasks that we do at work that have always seemed repetitive and unnecessary. We're always trying to automate in some way. It's just going to make them disappear. Do you do just before, before continue, do you believe in the idea of a one man billion dollar company because of the of AI? Huh? Yeah. You heard that. Yeah. And now they're making bets on the first $10 billion. Okay. Uh, well, well, if, um, uh, than me. Roughly speaking, if we're speaking um, like colloquially one, one man, you know, one yeah. or two. Right. Or, yeah, I do. I do. Yeah. Um, if we're talking about valuation, yes, I do. Um, I also think that's part of, remember I said like there's going to be a sustained earthquake coming. That sounds like a great story, that guy or gal who makes a billion dollar company by themselves. Uh, that also means they're taking it from somewhere else. And what seems like really established companies, really established businesses, they're now, their technical documentation, like I said, it could be a prologue to their epitaph. That That could be, because of that, they're now gettable by a person or two people. So I do believe it will happen. And I believe that it's not a zero sum game because this will increase productivity, but in some regards, it's a zero sum game. If someone's doing that, some other business is getting crushed. They're just getting crushed because they have 13,000 employees and they charge a million dollars a year for an enterprise seat. And this guy is going to sell it for $10 a month because I don't know, he's bored. Fair enough. Well, uh, thank you very much, Ophir. I appreciate your time. I appreciate you educating us. Uh, where can we learn more about you and your work? Oh, yeah. So if you want to get a uh, thank you, David, for having me and yeah, for hosting. Absolutely. Me. I love all of your stuff. Um, yeah, you can get my research. At, it's called CML Pro. You can just type CML Pro into, um, into Google and you'll find us. It's uh, economic reports. And I have a small group of companies, 10 to 15 tech companies, that I'm calling after this winners. I was calling after this, the after this winners companies that are doing, that are gaining market share now, whether or not their stock price is going up. And I think after this period, they're going to be winners. Okay. Well, make sure to follow uh, if you're in the links down below, we'll put that in the description. Thank you very much. We'll speak again soon. Thank you, David. I appreciate it. And thank you for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe.